Come on, you really didn't think we were going to let Pokemon Legends Arceus go by without a full analysis, did you? Rest assured that the analysis machine has been chugging away ever since the reveal trailer. And the darn thing nearly caught fire trying to process all the data. Just look at this disaster of an image that it's had to work with. Because while it might have seemed that the trailer didn't show off a whole lot about the game, you might be surprised by how much more there is to uncover, especially when it comes to the layout of the world itself. Yep, we gave it the full Breath of the Wild analysis treatment, and now, after three weeks of careful analysis and lots of crying, we're finally here to present our findings. Okay, so let's begin with the basics. Yes, this finally appears to be the open world Pokemon game that we've been waiting for. Gone are the series of linear routes filled with random battles, instead replaced with a giant Breath of the Wild style world, with expansive vistas, a proper day and night cycle based on the multiple times a day, and Pokemon that apparently roam free, all taking place within a strange land that's also strangely familiar. Because this is in fact Sinnoh, the one insane from Gen 4's Diamond and Pearl, but quite unlike we've ever seen it before. The narrator explains that the setting is a long time ago, as we witness a dark office just barely lit by the technology of the time, a gas-powered lamp. On the desk are Pokeballs that appear to be made of wood, which is pretty impressive, along with a stack of books, one of which features a map recognizably of the Sinnoh region on the cover, but still looking a bit different to how it did in Gen 4. If we layer the two maps on top of each other, we can see that while the broad strokes are mostly the same, there are quite a few subtle differences to be found, especially on the eastern seaboard, such as the C-shaped cove, which seems to have flattened out over time. Now interestingly, none of the many islands depicted in the modern map are shown here. So do they even exist in this time? Or maybe they haven't been discovered yet? Although the large cloud of the northeast does conveniently obscure where the largest one should be. It might just be an easy out by the developers to pretend as if it doesn't exist for the purposes of this game, but we really don't know for sure. Most importantly, Mount Coronet is still exactly where we'd expect to find it, in the dead center of the region, along with a mountain range that extends southward from it, seemingly dividing the lower half of the continent in half, again much like Gen 4. But we'll have more on that later. So though it is overall similar, this is also clearly a very different Sinnoh. The narrator describes it as a vast wilderness, and sure enough, we see almost nothing in the way of civilization outside of a small village. Otherwise, it's just water, mountains, and fields as far as the eye can see. It's all very Breath of the Wildish, only, you know, with Pokemon. And it's that purposeful sense of freedom that seems to be Legend's main hook. You're no longer confined to a series of narrow, linear routes, instead now having an unprecedented amount of freedom to explore. And that's supported by a freely rotatable camera, finally! Along with a brand new moveset, including diving, crouching, and throwing Pokeballs outside of battle. You can even aim while moving around. It's a bit like a third-person shooter. And all of this points to a dramatically different means of catching or at least finding Pokemon. Instead of Pokemon being the ones to randomly attack from tall grass, it's the trainer who can skulk through it in order to sneak up on Pokemon instead. Which is exactly why the trainer crouches down here, to blend in with the tall grass and get close without startling it off. Which it seems the trainer may have failed to do in this scene, which is why the Starly could be running away. And since we can see multiple patches of tall grass all throughout the trailer, it seems stealth is going to play a major role this time. Aww, analyzing grass-based stealth mechanics really takes me back. And to that point, it really does seem similar to how stealth worked in Breath of the Wild. Hey, wait a minute! When you really think about it, catching horses in Breath of the Wild really isn't all that different to catching Pokémon. Huh! And speaking of catching Pokémon, let's take a quick moment to cover all the ones shown off during gameplay. And that includes Piplup, Bidoof, Shinx, Rhyhorn, Chingling, Bronzor, Gallade, Garchomp, Starly, Chimchar, Lucario, Star Raptor, Turtwig, Pikachu, and Badoo, or 15 in total. Though we can also see Sfeel and Celio drawn in the notebook at the start of the trailer, bringing us up to 17 Pokemon in total. Now, if you know your Pokemon, or how to use Bulbapedia like myself, you might have noticed that all of them are native to the Sinnoh region, so no surprises there. And while it might suggest we'll only encounter Pokemon that we'd expect to find in modern day Sinnoh, it's far too early to say for sure. But interestingly, that Rhyhorn looks a little bit different to how we've seen them before, appearing as a sky blue color instead of the usual gray. What's up with that? Is it just a trick of the lighting? Or could it possibly hint at there being different forms of some Pokemon? Hmm. Anyways, let's get back to the moveset, as it can now dive into a roll too, but its exact function is a little bit more mysterious. After all, we haven't seen any actual enemies that you'd have to dodge. 
Not that I would even expect that, considering this is Pokemon and not Monster Hunter. But it does make you wonder if there could possibly be things for you to avoid in this world, because that is a pretty significant addition. We also know that's not really useful for faster travel, because even though the character does initially get a speed boost as they enter their dive, the follow-through actually slows them down, negating the difference. So that might suggest that its usage is far more contextual. And in this specific example, we see the trainer dive into the patch of grass. So it's probably meant to be used for making quick short-range movements to avoid being spotted, such as diving and rolling from one grass patch to another. We do see quite a few of them near each other after all. Now once you're in position, you can then arm one of them with Pokeballs, while still being able to freely move around before taking aim and throwing it at the creature. Once you do, it seems your trainer will automatically return to stealth mode if you were crouching beforehand. Which makes sense, seeing as how a missed throw is not just possible, but even likely. Which could tip the Pokémon off to your presence. In this particular case, we can see the Pokéball actually goes a little bit past the Pokémon, indicating it doesn't have to be a direct hit for it to be effective. You just have to get close enough. And much as we'd expect, we can even see the Pokéball float in the air as it sucks the Pokémon up, before dropping to the ground in an attempt to trap it inside. We can even see it hop around as the Pokémon attempts to escape. Which it doesn't this time. After a successful capture, the Pokeball magically gets whisked away, presumably to your Pokemon belt or wherever you keep them, or some kind of non-PC-based storage area, seeing as how PCs probably haven't been invented yet, and is a little similar to how catching Pokemon worked in the Go line of games, being Let's Go and Pokemon Go, in which you didn't have to battle Pokemon at all before capturing them. But that doesn't fully seem to be the case here, because wild Pokemon battles are still very much present, as we can see multiple throughout the trailer, without an opposing trainer in sight. So the question is, why are there battles if you're able to throw Pokeballs whenever you want to? Well, don't forget that the mainline games work pretty much the same way too, in that you always have the option to try and capture a Pokemon before even attacking them. It just doesn't usually work out for the stronger ones. So that's probably essentially the case here too. The only major difference is that they can attempt to capture outside of a proper battle. But since it appears the Pokémon will still be able to escape a Pokéball, you'll probably have to initiate a battle against the stronger ones in order to weaken them first before going for the capture. In fact, that's probably exactly what's happening in these two clips, in which we see a trainer first battling a Rhyhorn before attempting to capture it in the scene immediately after. But since the capture takes place outside of battle, we're assuming that means that the battle ends as soon as the opposing Pokémon faints, which likely causes them to stop moving outside of battle for some period of time making it easier to target them with a Pokeball. Unfortunately, we never see a trainer actually initiate a battle during the trailer, but we wouldn't be surprised if it's similar to the capture mechanic, except you throw a Pokeball containing your starter Pokemon instead, thereby starting the fight. Now there isn't a whole lot to say about the battles themselves, because they otherwise seem to function exactly as they always have. It's still turn-based, with status displays for both Pokemon showing their level, sex, and HP. Each Pokemon still has access to just four attacks at a time, which themselves have a limited amount of uses, just as they always have. Heck, it even seems you'll still be using a party of six Pokémon based on the amount of Pokéball icons beneath your status screen. The battles really do seem to be the least changed aspect of the game. But what has changed is the presentation, which looks to be a little bit more visceral and action-packed, with how the Pokémon actually get up close and personal, and making physical contact for basically the first time ever. The battles are presented in a letterbox format to make it even more cinematic, and the camera is constantly rotating to show the action from all sides. Although, because the height and rotation speed seems to change across the different battle scenes, we can't help but wonder if it might be controllable by the player too, at least to some extent. Another neat detail is a trainer's level of involvement, standing right next to the Pokémon as they issue commands, with their gaze even following their Pokémon's actions throughout the attack. Neat! Okay, so wild Pokémon battles are back. But what about trainer battles? There is no sign of them in the trailer at all. There aren't even signs of other trainers, period. The only trainer we see is a player's trainer in traditional male and female forms. And that's it. Which does kind of make sense given that this game takes place in the distant past, and that you're the one charged with developing the very first Pokédex. Which means you might just be the first Pokémon trainer too. Or among them at least. Meaning, there may not be any other trainers for you to fight. But on second thought, it sure would be odd to have a party of six Pokémon available for just the standard wild Pokémon battles, wouldn't it? So there almost has to be something more going on here. Maybe some wild Pokémon will be stronger than ever before? Or maybe you won't just be taking on one at a time? After all, multiple scenes showed numerous Pokémon within close proximity to each other, sometimes even of different species. So maybe they'll team up during battle too. 
If this game is aiming for a more organic take on Pokemon, letting them work and battle together seems like a natural fit. Now it is also possible that you won't be the only trainer here. Heck, maybe your actions will inspire others throughout the game. And that's not even to speak of a possible online component. But hey, we're just speculating. Alright, so that covers it for the core gameplay for now. So let's move on to the part that's made my life a living pokey hell the past few weeks. The world itself. As the world of Pokemon Legends looks absolutely massive, with nearly every scene offering what might appear to be entirely unique areas. But, while the world itself may indeed be massive, the amount of it shown in the trailer may not be quite as much as you think, as we've been able to uncover some interesting connections between these seemingly disparate scenes, which helps provide a much better understanding of the world, and far greater context for how each scene relates to the others. But before we go down that rabbit hole, just a quick note to help you keep track of everything we'll be discussing, including me once I get around to editing this darn thing together. <laughs> you owe me one, future Andre! So, between the trailer and the short feature that followed in the Pokemon Presents presentation, there are 31 unique gameplay scenes of the world in total, and we'll be referring to them by the number in which they appeared. So, the reveal of Mount Coronet is scene number 1, whereas the final in-game shot of the trailer is scene 20. And we'll keep on counting from that point the 11 additional scenes that came afterward in the Pokemon Presents feature, skipping over the repeated footage. Oh, and we didn't count this interior scene among them because we're only counting the outside shots. Got it? Cool! Or should I say, TENTACOOL! <laughs> I don't know why I said that, he's not even in this trailer! That was just a cruel joke. Or should I say, a TENTACRUEL joke! <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, this analysis has clearly just driven me mad. Anyways, let's dive in! But, rather than starting where the trailer does with Mount Coronet, let's do something crazy and start with scene 6, which shows a trainer looking out upon the vast world. And this scene is essential to our understanding of how this world fits together. He looks upon a wide open area with a river that cuts through at least some portion of it, and we can see a distant mountain range as a backdrop. Now those elements aside, there are at least three major landmarks to note here. One, what appears to be a spout of water on the left, so we'll just call it a geyser. Two, is a large bulbous tree dead ahead that towers over all the others. And three, is a strange rock formation on the right sitting atop a large landmass. And we'll be seeing more of all three throughout the trailer. But there are two more things around here that, while they may not quite reach landmark status, are no less important in helping to establish how this world's laid out. The first is a dirt path that extends from the trainer out into the world. And the second is actually related to it. But for that, we actually have to switch over to scene two, as it offers a very similar viewpoint to the same area, only from higher up. We can tell because not only does the dirt path match up perfectly with the one from scene six, but so do other nearby geographical features, like these distinctive stones here. Which would mean the trainer from the other scene should be positioned right about here. And this higher vantage point reveals a few things that were concealed from the trainer's perspective before, including this bridge, which should place it right about here in the trainer scene. And we actually get a much closer look at that bridge in scene 8. And we know it's the same bridge because we can also see the same rock landmark that we mentioned earlier from a similar angle, which means scene 8 should take place right about here, facing to the upper right. From this closer vantage point, we can see that the bridge is flanked with torches at the corners, which should make it easy to find at night, but we'll have more on this scene soon. For now, we can see that a dirt path leads from the trainer, up to the bridge, and past the strange rock formation, and we're pretty sure up to that giant tree, because we actually see what appears to be that same tree in scene 29. And sure enough, it has a dirt path leading right up to it, and it's lined with the same type of torches too, suggesting it's all part of the same path. This higher perspective also offers a much better view of the river, showing that it wraps at least partially around the landmass ahead, if not entirely, possibly making it a large island. In any case, there's definitely at least one island here, on the right, albeit much smaller, with just a single tree. And we get a much better look at the island in scene 30 with Lucario. And we know it's the same island not just because of the lone tree, but also because the mountain range matches perfectly with the one from scene 6, which is exactly where we'd expect to find the island based on scene 2, even though the mountain range is invisible here. Trust me when I say that connecting all these scenes was a complete nightmare, and we're just getting started. Furthermore, scene 16 appears to show that exact same location and battle, just with the other version of the trainer. And the camera's turned slightly left, in which we can just barely see the giant tree visible in the background, right about where we'd expect to find it, behind the giant center landmass slash island thing. So that will place the Pokemon battles taking place right about here, on the right side of the large landmass, which again is potentially an island itself. 
Now what else is interesting to note is the lack of mountain scene otherwise, because the one we used to place this scene seems to drop off to ground level, leaving trees are the tallest things in this direction. And if we go back to this bridge clip in scene 8, the trainer turns a corner revealing what seems to be the entire run up to the area, as we can see that exact same mountain to the left with nothing but trees right of it, and the terrain seems to be fairly unremarkable up to that point. And we get yet another possibly even better look at the area in scene 26, in which the trainer dives near a hill. If we freeze the clip at the very start, we can just barely see the strange rock formation we touched on earlier. And up ahead is that same flat area, as confirmed by the mountain range on the left, once again matching up with the one behind the small island from scene 30. But this time, we get a few new details. For one, the mountain range does appear to continue after this gap on the right. But within this gap, we can now see what appears to be a body of water. So maybe it's an inlet? Unfortunately, the blasted trees here prevent us from seeing much of anything more. So look, it's impossible to say for sure what lies beyond that line of trees, but that doesn't mean we can't try, because a lack of visible terrain suggests something completely flat beyond. You know, like an ocean maybe? And as it turns out, scene 3 shows exactly that with this beach clip, with almost nothing but water visible on the horizon. So while it's impossible to say whether this is the exact location or not, it might at the least offer an idea of what to expect. Now aside from the piplups found here, there's also an odd structure in the distance that forms a sort of archway. It looks a bit like a crab claw, or maybe a closed pair of pincers. In any case, it's almost certainly of some significance. Though what exactly, we have no clue. Maybe something happens if you go through it? Or maybe it frames something important, like a rising or setting sun perhaps. Now although it appears to be bordered on land by either side, we're not entirely sure that's accurate. The one on the left at the least appears as if it may be a small island, disconnected from the mainland, as it appears that water continues behind it. Now it's a little harder to tell what's going on with the land on the other side, but we wouldn't be surprised if it's a similar situation. Which might mean the archway is a freestanding structure. Furthermore, this beach seems to be more of a cove with how the water intrudes inland, and we get a better idea of that shape if we combine both ends of the scene into a single picture, which offers a slightly wider view of the area. We can see that the land seems to curve around the water, from the trees visible back here, through the beach, and possibly back out to the short cliff. That is assuming the cliff is connected to the mainland rather than being an island itself. If so, it seems this might possibly form the shape of a letter C, which is fitting given the fact this is the C. And that's potentially very interesting, because if we go back to the old-timey map, we can see a couple of C-shaped coves on it, which might hint at one of its possible locations relative to Mount Coronet. Before we move on, there's one last point to mention. Although we only see Piplops in this scene, the drawing at the start of the trailer shows him alongside Feel and Celio too, all of which are at least partially water-type Pokémon. So it might suggest that while Pokémon can, and I quote, roam free, they'll likely be found in areas suitable for their species. Anyways, let's get back to the main field as there's a lot more to uncover there, as scene 12 with the Bidoof appears to take place somewhere in this area too, given the fact that we can see the same geyser from earlier in the background. But we can do even better, but for that we need to skip all the way to the final scene, number 31, which offers an incredibly impressive view of this area. And look, there's a geyser dead ahead, along with a tree and the strange rock formation, showing this is a similar vantage point to the other two scenes we've already discussed. And you can even see the bridge and trail right down there, which puts us a bit to the left and significantly higher than the trainer's location in scene 6 from earlier. Anyways, do you see that tiny protrusion down there next to a small pond? It may not look like much, but it's key to this next part, because it's the exact same one we see in the Bidoof scene. And look, there's the pond. In case there's any doubt, the shape of the hill behind it matches up too. As does the V-shaped mountain range in the distance. Which means the Bidoof scene takes place right around here. Oh, and scene 4, which has even more Bidoofs, seems to take place around the same area too, only a bit closer to the river and with the camera facing rightward, as we can see the strange rock formation right there. And returning to this higher viewpoint for a second, we can see further evidence that the river might wrap all the way around the landmass in the middle, again making it an island, in addition to the river splitting off and continuing leftward. Alright, so we've covered quite a bit of the world so far, but there's one mountain-sized piece of the puzzle still missing, Mount Coronet itself and any scene containing it. So let's start off with scene 10, which offers a fantastic view of the mountain, along with a large field leading right up to it. A gap in the ridges ahead seems to suggest a narrow valley that might lead right up to the mountain. But beyond that, there really isn't a whole lot else to note about this scene, except for there being another dirt path and bridge here allowing passage across the river. Now, for the longest time, we had no idea where to place this scene or any of the ones featuring Mount Coronet, 
until we had a light bulb moment. And that's when we realized, what if that bridge and dirt path that we had originally written off as being a second set due to how completely different this area looks, are actually the same as the ones we've already discussed? We dismissed the idea originally because there's nothing else uniquely identifiable about this area for us to match between the scenes. I mean, maybe besides groups of trees. But even that's nearly impossible because, as you might have noticed, some of the details in the world seem to pop in and out depending on your distance in this version of the game. Meaning, we can't always trust what little we can or can't see. But the more we thought about it, the more we realized it's the only thing that makes sense. Consider this. From the perspectives we've already explored, we've seen a significant chunk of the world likely far exceeding 180 degrees, at least in this region. And yet, Mount Coronet is nowhere to be found. So unless David Copperfield is out here performing a magic trick, that means Mount Coronet has to be somewhere in the remaining less than half of the world that we haven't yet explored. As in, somewhere behind or to the left here of scene 6. And then, when you factor in that we've otherwise only seen the one dirt path and bridge so far, well, sometimes it's the simplest explanation that makes the most sense. Which again is that this is the exact same bridge, only we're now viewing it from the other side. As in that the same large landmass is probably an island containing the strange rock formation. Which should be somewhere in that direction. So if we had to guess, we'd place a trainer standing right about here looking toward the bottom left direction. Which would place Mount Coronet at around 7 to 9 o'clock the trainer's position here in scene 6. And we can now use this information to fill in some of the other blanks. Such as the very first gameplay scene in the trailer, which we know has to be from the same side of Mount Coronet, because the valley below appears to be the same one who pointed out in scene 10. Trust me, it's the same shape, which should place a female trainer's vantage point from the other scene in a high ridge somewhere over here. And if you freeze the clip at the very start, it's not only obvious that the rest of the field matches with scene 10, but we can even see a river winding its way through the valley, presumably from the bridge. And that's likely the same river that we can see branching off to the left here from scene 2. Which, remember, is the same one in scene 10 that we can just barely see, but obviously now Noah's there. But let's turn our attention back to the valley. Do you see those trees back there? Well, I think that's exactly where scene 11 takes place with the Chingling and the easy-to-miss Bronzorts. Look, there is the valley with what appears to be Mount Coronet just barely visible through the trees. We can even see what seems to be a hint of the river leading up to it. This scene also offers what might be our best look at what's down to the left of Mount Coronet. Which, surprise, is more fields and mountains. Which, again, for reference, places the trainer from these earlier Vista scenes like in Scene 6 somewhere over in that general direction. Okay, now there are only two scenes left that clearly show Mount Coronet. First is Scene 17 with the Badoo, which seems as if it may be in the same general area, just a bit farther back given the scale of the mountain, likely putting the river and valley somewhere down there. Unfortunately, there isn't much uniquely identifiable to get much more specific than that. And that's similarly the case for scene 23. Except, of course, for the valley through which the river runs below. And we think it might be the same one you've already mentioned for a couple of reasons. One, we haven't seen any other valleys quite like this. And two, we can see out the other side, revealing what might be a part of Mount Coronet that's been obscured in every other scene, being the lower left. Which might place this scene somewhere along this ridge in scene 1 or about here in scene 10. Although, Mount Coronet does appear to be a little farther away than we might otherwise expect, but it's really impossible to tell for sure based on a variety of factors. But we do have one other idea for where the scene might possibly take place, because if we follow the river back from Mount Coronet, through the field, back to where it reconnects with what we think is a large island, there really don't appear to be any ridges close enough to the river to form a valley at any other point, except for maybe one. This guy right here, on the far side of the river, just in front of the geyser. And between it and the giant island in the middle, it might form a valley-like shape. Which would mean the field we see through it in scene 23 might just be the same field in front of the other valley that we've already discussed. Or basically the general area where these Bidouk scenes took place. Which for reference would place a second valley somewhere over there. And as for the part of Mount Coronet that appeared to be unobstructed before, well, the ridge from scene 10 might still be just in front of it as the texture on the mountain does appear as if it might change a little bit. But again, it's really hard to say definitively one way or the other. And that covers it for all of the scenes that clearly show Mount Coronet. I say clearly because of what's in scene 21, which offers a nearly 360 degree view of the world. Did you catch it? You know, Mount Coronet? I promise you it's there! But it's ridiculously easy to miss because the trees almost completely obscure it. You can just barely spot the bottom right edge of it at the start of the clip, and a bit later, we can catch most of the left side along with a peak. <laughs> Who knew a giant mountain could be so sneaky? Here's the clip one more time with the mountain highlighted.
And that's not the only landmark hiding here. At the very start of the clip, we can see the top of the tall tree peeking out. And it seems we're relatively close to it, which confirms that it's located behind the giant center island rather than on it from the perspective of scene 6. As that's exactly what we're looking at right here. It just looks a little different now because we're on the back side of it. And we're even more certain of its island status now because toward the end of the clip, we can just barely see that the river appears to split off on this side too. So we'd really be surprised if it doesn't circle all the way around at this point. Speaking of which, do you see the small island right there? We're pretty sure it's the same one you mentioned earlier visible from scene 2, right by where the Pokemon battle of scene 16 and 30 take place, which for reference should take place right about here when viewed from scene 21. And if we reverse it, that means scene 21 should be somewhere right about here when viewed from the battle in scene 16, just right to the giant tree. So, based on all these landmarks, that should place scene 21 is taking place somewhere around here when viewed from the perspective of scene 6. Anyways, this clip also gives us our best look yet at the area to the left, which for reference should be to the right of scene 6. Unfortunately, it isn't terribly interesting besides showing more fields, trees, and a look at the mountain range we haven't seen much of yet. But there is something else interesting here. For that, let's go to scene 13. Do you recognize this? Does it look familiar to you at all? Yeah, it's actually the exact same area. It just looks completely different at dusk. Don't believe me? Look, the mountain range matches up perfectly. Kinda weird, huh? At any rate, that covers all the clips of Mount Coronet, but there are still a few more scenes that we haven't placed yet. So let's start with scene 19, in which the trainer is seen walking away from the giant tree. And this is basically the second closest shot of the tree that we have, and it seems to show it within the middle of a forest. But where exactly does this take place? Well, based on the angle and the fact that the mountain range appears to match up with the one from the trainer's perspective in scene 31, it seems to be somewhere on the backside of the large central island. And by that we mean actually on the island toward the backside. Furthermore, although the tree may appear to be in the middle of a dense forest, in actuality it may be behind it, since we can't see much in the way of shrubbery behind it in the close-up from scene 29. And while we're here, there is something else unusual we wanted to point out. If you look at the base of the giant tree, we can see the remains of some fallen pillars, seemingly from an ancient era. Yeah, it seems there's some history to the region even in these early days. And it's likely whatever it was, a monument to the giant tree perhaps, was of some significance given that the dirt trail leads right up to it too, along with of course a giant tree. Now speaking of that trail, we can see it pop up again in scene 15 with a chimchar, and is lined with the same torches by the giant tree as well as a bridge, meaning it's almost certainly somewhere along that same path. But where exactly, we have no idea since we can see so little else of the world. Though if we had to guess, it's probably somewhere in that giant center island. Then we have scene 25, which doesn't appear to have a ton of distinctive features either. But based on the Chingling here, it might take place near the other clip featuring that same Pokemon, being scene 11, which we've already placed. And to back this up, we can see a Bidoof hanging around right there too. Which would make sense as we had also placed the earlier Bidoof scenes as taking place around this general area too. Which remember was just down here, left of the bridge, in front of the valley that leads to Mount Coronet. Next, we have scene 18 of Pikachu, and like some of the others, there's nothing here that seems to match up with the other clips. The only real noteworthy thing here is a land bridge over the river, which is kind of neat, because we haven't seen it anywhere else. So it's possible this is on the back side of the large island, acting as a more natural bridge to reach it, or at the least allowing passage over one of the rivers near it. Moving on, in scene 28, we have a body of water visible behind the trainer, along with a pathway leading through a valley behind it. And like the others, there isn't quite enough here for us to confidently place it. The gap in the distant mountain range does remind us a bit of the area where we speculated the beach might go, but it doesn't seem to be the same area as the bordering mountains don't match. But at the least, it could still possibly mean that we're near the coastline. And also, isn't it a little odd that the valley trail butts up right against the water? As in, you'd have to venture through the water to reach it? So, can your trainer swim? Or perhaps, like in the mainline games, you might be able to use a Pokemon Surf ability in order to reach it. And that makes us excited for the possibility of other overworld abilities returning too. Who needs Breath of the Wild style climbing when you can just fly instead? Now before we move on, we do notice one more thing. If we zoom all the way in on the back of the valley trail, we can see what appears to be some kind of structure, or at least something tall. Could it be man-made? Maybe the town even? That valley does look a little similar to the one that we can see outside the village although the perspective doesn't seem to quite match up. And hey, even the ground texture looks a little similar too. 
But we're really just spitballing here, and even if that is a town, it doesn't really narrow down where the town actually is. So perhaps this is a good time to move on to the town itself, which has the final set of scenes we have yet to explore. And there is a lot to go over here. But before we get into the nitty gritty, let's first address where in the world the town may be located. And well, we really don't know. The trailer unfortunately shows very little of the surrounding area, with only a small section of a mountain range to be found, which we weren't able to match up to any other scene. But that doesn't mean we can't guess as to where it might be. Consider this. We haven't really seen any concrete signs of the village anywhere else in the trailer. So that helps narrow down where it isn't. Yeah, I'm more of a glass half full kind of guy. Now one of the areas that we presumably haven't seen much of yet, or anything of, is what's behind the trainer in scene 6, or so we thought. But considering this scene takes place immediately afterward in a very similar looking area, during a part of the trailer that's totally establishing the world, we have an inkling it's the exact same area, only with a camera facing the opposite direction, in which we can see the dirt path winds down into a valley, around what looks to be a lake. And if we go back to scene 5, we can see a similar dirt trail extends out from town up through a valley. So it's possible that these two areas connect especially given the context of these scenes coming immediately after the town scene. So it's possible that the dirt path extends from the village, across the bridge to the island, all the way to the giant tree. So if this is the only path through the world, could it be the original Route 1? Eh, who knows? So if all this is the case, that might mean that the town isn't all that far removed from Mount Coronet, based on our geographical findings from earlier. And that in and of itself might be interesting. Because, as you might recall from Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, one of the cities closest to Mount Coronet was Celestic Town. And it just so happened to be one of the oldest towns in the game, and aimed to preserve Sinnoh's history, which is why it featured a shrine in the middle of town from ancient times. So, point is, could this be the starting point of Celestic Town? Or if not, perhaps one of the other towns nearby in the original games? It's possible. Anyways, moving on, a large gate guards the town entrance, and permitting entry onto a main street flanked with at least four buildings, each of a different color. Red, purple, green, and burgundy, with the roof of the gate itself being teal. And it seems most of these buildings are of some significance considering at least the first two feature three different entrances. But as to what each of them are, we really have no idea. It's possible the color coding provides some kind of clue. After all, Pokemon centers have historically been red, so maybe that's what this one on the left is all about. It's also possible that these buildings house three different venues inside with a door for each one. Unfortunately, we have no idea how far back the street may actually go, as every scene in the trailer is careful to avoid showing anything beyond the green and burgundy buildings. And that even goes for the artwork at the very start of the trailer too. Although it does at least confirm these back two buildings feature at least two doors as well, and likely three to match the front two. So there's clearly something more here that the developers don't want us to see. It might just be Mount Coronet itself, or possibly something more. That being said, there actually is more going on here than you probably realize. For one, the road branches off to the left and right at the town's entrance, indicating there's more to find in town. In fact, we can see a fifth building right here, with an entrance facing outward. And we know there's even more to the right of it, because in this clip we can see a gap through the buildings, through which we can see even more buildings! One of which has a yellow roof similar style to the others, whereas the other is a simple brown, matching the building up front. Although, there's a visible gap between those two buildings as well, through which we can see the cliffside suggesting there aren't any more beyond them. And we wouldn't be surprised if something like this is the case on the other side of town too. In fact, in clip 5, we can just barely see the roof of yet another building, supporting the very idea. So it seems there are likely three entire streets worth of buildings here, although it's likely only the main one in the middle is lined with buildings on both sides. While we're here, we can see some smaller details too, like some shells containing pottery, along with a small shed attached to the green building. There's even a ladder resting against it, though given its cramped position, it probably isn't usable. But there are a couple of ladders in town that almost certainly are, and those are the ones on either side of the town gate, with the left one leading up to a bell tower, while the one on the right might just be a lookout. Now if we take a step back, this is a fairly impressive looking structure. We can see the large open doors with fences extending out on either side, presumably to the natural cliff wall surrounding the village, which seems to leave this gate as the only opening, at least that we can see. So this seems to be a pretty well fortified entrance, but why? Surely there's a reason for it, but what are they trying to keep out? It might be a sign of the true danger that wild, untamed Pokemon pose in these ancient times. Although, wild Pokemon do still exist in the modern day too, without the need of a fortified town entrance. But that could be explained away by most everyone being an experienced Pokemon trainer in modern times, and Pokemon possibly being used to being around human civilization. Whereas, as we mentioned earlier, neither of those seem to be the case in these early times. 
But it also makes us wonder there could be a larger threat too, like other human civilizations. After all, the narrator referred to this town as, and I quote, a certain village bustling with the comings and goings of people, which might hint at there being more villages, perhaps some less friendly than others? Though the narrator later adds that people have journeyed here from all over, suggesting that travelers from other regions are visiting Sinnoh for the first time. In any case, if there are more villages to be found, it would explain the color-coded buildings here so you can more easily find your way around other settlements, assuming they have similar businesses. In addition, it's possible that this gate serves some kind of actual in-game function too, such as the town closing up shop for the night, similar to the drawbridge in Ocarina of Time. Or it could be context-dependent, maybe if a dangerous wild Pokémon or human force gets too close? And that bell likely serves some related purpose, possibly announcing whenever the town's opening up or closing down for the day, or warning of imminent danger. Now there is one more scene that we haven't touched on yet that possibly takes place in this town too. Maybe. And it's a final gameplay clip from the trailer in which we see Cyndaquil, Rowlet, and Oshawott hanging around in the hallway of what appears to be a fairly large building, as we can't even see where the hallway ends. Now these three Pokémon are almost certainly the starting Pokémon, both because they're the typical grass, fire, and water types, and also because the narrator basically confirms it. But what's interesting is that not only were these three Pokémon not the starting Pokémon in Gen 4, but they aren't even native to the Sinnoh region, unlike the other 17 seen elsewhere in the trailer. But the narrator explains this as the professor found them while traveling through other regions in the world, implying Alola for Rowlet, Johto for Cyndaquil, and Unuva in Oshawott's case, which taken all together covers half of the eight known Pokémon regions. So this building is very likely the professor's lab, or lab equivalent, and the messy room behind them is probably the professor's office. And it looks a bit disorganized, what with the paper scattered on the floor, and piles of books or papers stacked on the desk. And speaking of which, we can't help but wonder this might be the same desk as in the pre-rendered opening. They're both made of wood and a bit messy after all, but since we're viewing them from exactly opposite angles, it's impossible to say for sure. But it would make a lot of sense if they were both the professors. Anyways, to the left of the desk is an easel that seems to be supporting a painting of some kind. So between that and the drawings of the start of the trailer, it seems this professor might be a bit of an artist, assuming they're both theirs of course. And on the right, we can see a bird perch. Could this be for the professor's own Pokémon, obviously making it a bird of some kind? Maybe, though it's also possible it's just a perch for Rowlet, since it is one of the starters. Which would lend more credence to the idea that this is, in fact, the professor's office. But where exactly is this building located? We're thinking it's probably not one of the buildings we've already seen for a couple of different reasons. One, the window designs are different, although it is possible the windows on the backside match. Keep in mind that the view would be at the backside of other buildings that we now know are behind them. And that seems unlikely for what appears to be an important office such as this. Secondly, the buildings themselves don't appear to be deep enough to account for all the interior space. Though, to be fair, this is a video game and that could be easily fudged. So we're thinking this could be what's waiting at the end of the street that we can't see. It would make sense for this building to be located in a place of some prominence, especially if it acts as a base of operations, as we expect it might given the fact that you're tasked with developing the very first Pokédex. But that opening sequence does draw a stark difference between the two scenes. How is this one so bright and uniformly lit? Especially since it appears to be nighttime. <laughs> We're pretty sure they didn't have light bulbs back then. Now look, this is a Pokémon game, and it's never been the most graphically advanced series, so this might just be how indoor spaces look. But join us as we go on a quick wild journey as we explore a wild theory. Because we can't help but wonder this might be hinting at something more. Like the idea of this scene taking place in a different time or place. One that actually does have modern lighting. It would explain why the window design doesn't seem to match the ones in the village, and why the starters aren't from the Sinnoh region. So, could there be some space-time shenanigans going on here? Okay, probably not, at least this specifically. Especially since it doesn't quite jive with the narrator's description. But there clearly still is something mysterious at play here, because there's still one more detail that we haven't mentioned yet at all, and that's a strange insignia that can be found in both of the flags of Flank the Desk, which incidentally is the same icon found in the trainer's outfit too. And we don't think that's a coincidence. At the very least, it might suggest that the trainer is working a little bit closer than usual on the professor's behalf. But even more importantly is what that symbol might represent, because it's strangely similar to the icon for Team Galactic from Gen 4. You know, the organization led by Cyrus, who only wanted to use the powers of a legendary Pokémon in order to destroy the entire world and rebuild it in his image. Hey, it's important to have goals. So could this be the origin story of Team Galactic? Are you actually playing on the villain side the entire time? Well, anything's possible, though we doubt the game would have you explicitly working for the enemy. It is, however, entirely possible that whatever preceded Team Galactic started with noble intentions. 
with its mission perhaps being corrupted or co-opted over the years. It's impossible to say what the exact angle is here, but there is another important element too. And that's the fact that the legendary Pokemon Arceus is obviously involved in a major way. It's even in the game's title. And the trailer seems to confirm the legend that they're basically a god responsible for the world's creation, as shown by the camera swooping over a developing world. So could this region actually be a reborn Sinnoh? As if Cyrus actually succeeded and hit the Universal Reset button? We can only speculate, but there's a lot going on to this mystery. Woo! Alright, we're nearly done here. Thank God because I'm so done with this video. But there are two final points I wanted to make. First, we know that Mount Coronet is still located in the middle of the region thanks to this old-timey map. But interestingly, as far as we can tell, every single scene in the trailer seems to take place facing the same side of the mountain. And we know this not just because we mapped out almost every location relative to the others, but also because the mountain features a noticeable bulge higher up on the left side than the right, which appears to be consistent across every scene. In addition, we always see the same arrangement of clouds surrounding the peak, with the ones on the left being higher up than the ones on the right. So, taken all together, this could mean one of two things. That we're only ever going to explore the half of the region on this side of the mountain, or there might be an entire second half of this region that we haven't yet seen, behind Mount Coronet. Yeah, that's exciting, isn't it? Finally, as we touched on throughout the video, there appears to be a mountain range that extends from either side of Mount Coronet, effectively encircling the area that we've explored so far. And that might possibly show the limits of the area that you can explore. But if we go by the map, while we can see that a mountain range is depicted adjacent to Mount Coronet, it extends in just one direction, south. And that actually matches up with how it's depicted in the Gen 4 games. But again, that doesn't seem to quite gel with what we've seen in the mountains in-game, that seem to extend from it in both directions. So is this just creative license with how the mountains are depicted on the map versus in-game? Or is it possible there's another mountain range we haven't seen yet, being behind Mount Coronet? And if that's the case, it might divide that portion of the island in two, which could possibly mean that everything we've seen so far takes place north of Mount Coronet. It makes you think, huh? And there you have it, our analysis of Pokemon Legends Arceus is finally done! And I don't know about you, but I could really use a nap about now. So thank you so much for watching the entire thing. If you enjoyed it, please consider clicking the like button and subscribing to the channel and ringing that bell. And make sure to check out the other videos on the screen for even more of our content. With that, we'll catch you later. Bye everyone!